everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, does this does it sound okay for everybody? Okay. Um, so I'm Dr. Klein. I'm one of the board certified veterinary nu nutritionists here at Red Bank. Um, so I just started this summer. Um, so I've only already been here half a year, so it's flying by. Um, so one of the things I'm going to talk to you guys about today is weight management um, and obesity prevention in cats and dogs, which I think is one of the in terms of nutritional issues that the most common nutritional issue that we deal with, this is it. Um, so thank you guys all for coming in and listen to my talk today. Um, so what we're gonna talk about, so we're really gonna divide it up into about four different sections. So first we're gonna talk about the prevalence and the health consequences of overweight and obesity. Then we're going to talk about how to identify overweight and obese pets. And then we're going to talk about how we implement a weight loss program and things that you guys can do at home to help your animals scale back their weight. And then we're going to talk about prevention. And so what the goals of this talk are for you guys as clients and pet owners is one, to be able to accurately assess your own animal's body condition. So how do you know if they're overweight or obese? So I want you guys to be able to go home tonight, look at your animal and be able to tell what their body condition is. Um, the other thing, the second part is for you guys to know how to account for your pet's calorie intake. And then the third thing is to be able to implement changes at home to help your animal achieve a more ideal body condition. So the prevalence of overweight and obesity is really variable. So there's about 10 or so different studies out there from all different countries uh, in the world. And the amount of overweight dogs ranges from anywhere between 29 to 37%. And then obesity is five to 15 percent. So that's about a total of 59 percent of, of dogs um, that are either overweight or obese. And then with cats, it's a tiny bit less, but in cats overweight, uh, about 10 percent, uh, almost up to 30 percent overweight and obese, 2 percent, all the way up in some studies to 35 percent. So we're looking at about almost 40 percent of cats are overweight or obese. And again, these are from studies from all over the world. So there's a more recent study that's come out looking from 2012. And it's so, it is actually a website that you could go to, the um, petobesityprevention.com. It's a really great website. Uh, and what they do is they take a national survey. Um, and what they did in this survey in 2012 is they didn't look at the entire population in the United States, but they looked at a sampling of about 1,200 veterinary clinics. And then they looked at the prevalence of overweight and obesity in those hospitals. And what they found was 53% of adult dogs were either overweight or obese, and 55% of adult cats are overweight or obese. So when you extrapolate that and consider the entire population of animals that we have in the United States, you get gigantic numbers of overweight and obese animals. So 36.7 million dogs and 43.2 million cats. So basically, there's no reason for me not to have a job. <laughs> um, there is plenty of things for me to do. So this survey goes on to look at the owner perception of overweight and obesity. And so what they found is 45.8% of dog owners and 45, almost 50%, almost half of the owners of cats and dogs, they incorrectly identified their animal as normal when they were in fact overweight or obese when their veterinarian assessed them. So one of the big things, so Dr. Ernie Ward, he's a veterinarian that's appeared a lot nationally and is, is uh, well published in pet obesity. And this is a quote that I got from him. So the fact that few pet owners admit that their pet is obese leads to a lack of interest in helping their pet lose weight. They know it's a problem, but they just don't recognize that the problem is in their animal. So looking at all the risk factors that go into obesity. So it's not just, you know, a simple matter of, they ate a lot of food. But there's a lot of different things that can go into play. So looking at the breed of dog, we know that as animals age, their metabolism is going to change and that they may have some more issues with weight. We also spay and neuter all of our animals, which also is gonna change their metabolism. So that we know that spaying and neutering can sometimes lower their energy requirements. The food and feeding. So you're feeding a really, really high calorie food. You're ad libitum feeding, so leaving food out free choice. Also the activity and lifestyle, so they're not getting up and moving around, they're basically just couch potatoes. Um, do they have concurrent diseases? So some animals may have some endocrine diseases that may predispose them to gaining a lot of weight, like hypothyroidism or Cushing's disease. Their metabolic rate, so whenever I, there are calculations that I can do to calculate the metabolic rate of an animal, but that's 
a calculation assuming that every animal is the same. And we know that not every animal is the same, just like not every person is the same. So these are just some of the breeds that are maybe at a little bit of a higher risk. And so for all you cat owners, we're pretty much out of luck. It's like all of them. Because <laughs> um, pretty most they, uh, there are far more mixed breed cats out there than there are purebred cats. Um, but in my practice, and animals that I see that, some of the ones that I think have some of the biggest problems with obesity, I see a lot of beagles, a lot of beagles that are overweight and obese. Um, lots of goldens, lots of labradors. And now goldens and labradors and beagles are really, really popular dogs to have. So that may throw off, you know, maybe some bias that we may have to these breeds. Um, but all of these breeds, I, I think I've seen one of each of these breeds that's overweight and obese. And, and it's not just limited to these breeds. Any breed of dog and any mixed breed dog can become overweight or obese. So these are all of the different health risks associated with obesity. Um, and if you guys don't mind, I, I have to take sips of water frequently or my mouth dries out. <gasps> so we can kind of classi classify the health risk in several different ways. So looking at metabolic complications, so some of these animals may have issues with the way that the fat circulates in their, in their body, just like people may. Um, with cats, it's insulin resistance and hepatic lipidosis is something that we see. Cats are actually a really good model for type 2 diabetes in people. Looking at the different endocrine abnormalities that may happen, like I said, diabetes mellitus. Uh, we also see some of these other changes, functional things, so exercise intolerance. A Big, I think the biggest one is osteoarthritis and the impact it has on mobility in these animals. I cannot even, I think every animal that I put through a weight loss program, one of the things that I always hear near the end is how much more mobile they are. And then looking how the ob overweight and obesity plays into other diseases, we know that it can increase the risk of cancer, um, it can change kidney function. Uh, a lot of these animals have a lot of skin issues. So. Being overweight and obese is really not a benign thing. It's something that can have a lot of consequences on other parts of the animal's health. And other things that to consider is, you know, whenever we're doing therapeutics or diagnostic procedures, these animals are always at a higher risk, particularly for anesthesia. And so again, these are all things that are really important. So looking at some very specific studies that are done in veterinary medicine, so cats in particular, so cats are three times more likely to be taken to their veterinarian because of lameness when they're overweight or obese. Um, this study also said, looked at obese cats, so four times more likely to develop diabetes mellitus, 2.3 times as likely to develop non-allergic skin conditions, and five times as likely to present for lameness. In dogs, um, obesity uh, increases the incidence of musculoskeletal disease, so osteoarthritis, or if they have any type of pre-existing uh, bone disease or muscular disease. It can also pre exacerbate any pre-existing cardiovascular or respiratory disease. So there's something in people called Pickwickian syndrome. And basically, as people become very overweight, um, they'll have excess fat accumulation in their chest that'll also push on their diaphragm and that can inhibit their respiratory function. And unfortunately, that's something that we also see in, in I would, it's not limited to dogs. I, we also see it in cats. So this is one of the, in terms of studies that have happened in veterinary medicine, there are studies that we can consider pivotal papers. This is one of the most pivotal papers that is a nutritionist that I have available to me. And so this study was a lifetime study where they followed these dogs from the time that they were puppies all up until the time that they died. And so these types of studies are very, very rare in veterinary medicine because of the time and the financial commitment involved with that. So this is one of the first studies that came out looking at this in dogs. So what they did is they took 49 intact Labradors and they paired them. So uh, 24 in one group and 24 in the other group. And 24 of those dogs were fed 25% fed less than the other dogs. And then they, that's basically their intervention. That's all they did. And then they followed these guys for the entirety of their life. And we're gonna talk about this a little bit more, the body condition score, when we talk about how to identify overweight and obesity. Um, but the dogs that were lean had a body condition score of 4.6, so that's right in the middle. Um, so the scale is from 1 to 9. And the dogs that were overweight or obese, they were 6.7. So that means that they were not obese, they were just overweight. What they found is that the dogs that were fed significantly less and were leaner lived two years longer 
than the dogs that were just overweight. So we're not even talking about obesity. We're talking about overweight. The other thing that was interesting from this is they also looked at the time of onset of chronic diseases and when these animals had to start being treated for these chronic diseases. So they looked at these dogs, and so when 50% of the dogs were still surviving without requiring treatment for chronic conditions, they found that the dogs that were overweight, they needed treatment when they were about 10 years old. The dogs that were lean, 12 years old. So looking at that in terms of preventative medicine and preventing the clinical signs associated with a lot of different diseases that happen in the animals get older, these dogs had two more, or had two more years on them to wait. So from a financial perspective, keeping your dog lean and a health perspective, all of these are really, really important. So this is one, of, this to me is one of the coolest studies that we have. And then they looked at causes of death and they were very similar across the board. So identifying over obesity and overweight in our animals. So what we use most commonly is the body condition score. And I actually left these upstairs in my office, but before you leave, I'm gonna run upstairs and grab copies of the body condition scoring sheets that you guys can take home with you. And so this is what we use most commonly to assess whether or not an animal is overweight or obese. And this is pretty similar to BMI and people, but it's a little bit different. And what we're ultimately trying to figure out, and what this is validated to show, is what the body fat percentage is. So that's ultimately what we're trying to find out. So looking at the body condition scale in dogs, so it's from a zero, I mean from a one to a nine. And so ones, these are gonna be your emaciated dogs. So these are gonna be the sad guys that you're gonna see on TV or the really, really, really chronically ill animal that's just wasted away. So they're going to have very, very prominent ribs, a very, very, very defined um, waist after their ribs, and they're just gonna look skinny. We've all seen these dogs. Um, threes, they're gonna have a little bit more to them, um, usually just a little bit more fat. So we're looking at animals that are maybe five, 10% body fat. Five is where you want to be. So five, you're going to have this nice tuck when you look at them from the side. When you look at them from the top, you're going to have a little nip in right behind the waist, um, right behind the uh, rib cage. Um, some of the other things that I'm going to feel on them is I'm going to feel for their ribs. I should be able to feel all of their ribs nice and easy. I shouldn't have to push really hard to try to feel them. Um, um, but I don't want to see all of the ribs. So it's okay usually to see the last couple of ribs but not all of them. Um, this is where we start. So these guys are usually our overweight dogs and these are obese dogs. So you can see now, now we are not going in, we're going out. Um, we have a distended abdomen. Some of the other things that I think are really prominent when you're looking at an obese animal, and one of the keys to me when an animal is becoming obese, and this is just dogs, this isn't cats. Cats are weird and they distribute their fat all different ways. Um, but dogs, if you feel around their tail base, if you feel along their spine, if you feel a little dip right before their tail base and they have, a, they have a little dimple, that's usually because they're having excess fat around their tail base. And usually to me, that's when I know that they're becoming obese. And so you wanna feel around that tail base and see if you feel excess fat around that area. Cats are a little bit different. So skinny cats, um, again, they're, they're gonna look similar to really skinny dogs. So you may be able to see all of their ribs. If they were at once quite overweight, they may still have a lot of that extra extra skin. Cat's skin doesn't tend to snap back the way that dogs does. Um, ideal body weight cat, these I feel, you know, and I'm biased because of the way I practice, and so I, I'm going to have a different population of animals that are gonna come to me. But when I talk to a lot of GP practitioners, we don't see a lot of cats that look like this. We don't see them with the waist when you look at them from the above, or we don't see them with an abdominal tuck. Um, a lot of times though, sometimes if cats were previously overweight and they become back to ideal, again, they're gonna have a lot of, they'll have a little pouch. <laughs> and that pouch usually doesn't go away. So my cat, just a side story, when I was in college and I started working in a vet clinic, I brought my 17 pound cat in to my vet hospital. And my boss, who I call my vet dad, um, he was like, your cat is really fat. And, you're, and you know, he's gonna be blunt with me because I work for him. Um, so he didn't sugarcoat anything with me. He was like, your cat is really fat and you need to make, your cat looks like a basketball because she's a big orange cat. You need to get your cat to lose weight. And she was my first nutrition project and she's 15 now, so she's much older, but she weighs about nine pounds and that's where she should weigh. So it took a long time, it took about a year and a half, but it worked. So she's part of the reason I am a nutritionist. 
Um, I have a picture of her at the end, so you all get to see how cute she is. Um, with obese cats, they don't usually have a lot of the tail-based fat accumulation unless they are kind of the super morbidly obese cat. So a lot of times we can usually feel their ribs, or the feel their um, spine, but it may be very difficult to fill their ribs, and they tend to get a lot of visceral fat, so a lot of intra-abdominal fat. They also have a, a fat pad, where, and usually the fat pad is the last thing to go. So the fat pad, um, it, it's going to be right under their belly and between their legs. You can kind of feel that and feel how much fat accumulation is in there. So looking at what these body condition score numbers actually mean, so this, is, this scale has been validated to correlate to body fat percentage. So when animals are obese, and for me, overweight, and, and I kind of didn't circle the number six here because some of these animals, especially older animals, sometimes I'll let them sit at just a tiny bit overweight. Um, but for me, overweight animals, for a young, healthy adult animal, sixes and sevens are overweight. Obesity is eight out of nine. And we'll talk a little bit. We have a lot of nine pluses out there. So obese animals are gonna be about 40 to 45% body fat. And obesity really starts when you're about 35% body fat. Overweight starts when you're about 25% body fat. All right. So these are some of my old patients, actually, from my residency. Um, so if we're looking at this dog and we're ranking her on a body condition score, so, um, we're, so the one to nine, what do you guys think she is? Seven, nine, eight. Okay. So we're going to get the answer in a minute. What about this dog? Let's turn it down a little bit. And you can tell this dog's had back surgery, so we probably need to lean him up a little bit. So what do you think? Eight, nine? Nine, ten? Okay. <laughs> Fifteen. <laughs> I think this is obvious who she is. This is Mabel. We're going to talk about Mabel. I can tell you that this is my, my like, prize nutrition case. All right. All of these cats, all of these dogs are nine or above. This is Franny. She's at the top end of that body condition scoring system. She's 45% body fat. Snorky, 57, and Miss Mabel. She wins. She is 67. She is still the fattest dog I have ever seen in my life. All right, so now we have this problem. This is where our body condition scoring system ended. So that body condition scoring system is from the early 90s. Now we have this problem of all of these animals that are falling 50, 45, maybe potentially up to the 70% body fat range. So we have to know what to do with these animals. So there are new scales that are being developed that really help us be able to better identify when we're now dealing with the super morbidly overweight animals. Cats, this is a very heavy slide, very, lots and lots of information on this slide. But really the point is to illustrate that there's a lot of different ways that animals will accumulate their body fat, and we have a lot of different ways as veterinarians to be able to try and classify them and to try to get them into what body fat percentage we think they're going to be, because that's what we want to know so that we can figure out what their ideal body weight is going to be. So how do you know what your pet's ideal body weight is? So there's a lot of different ways to do this. Um, and so some of the easiest ways, you know, for me, I. I've been doing this for a few years, so sometimes I get lucky and I can have a really good guess. And sometimes owners will guess because they've known their animal their whole life and they can get pretty good. So an educated guess. So that's one way, probably the least scientific way to do it. You can look at breed-specific tables, and this is something that I've pulled out periodically, especially when I have maybe a more rare breed available, or a rare breed that I'm dealing with. Sometimes it's hard because, particularly like Labradors, I've seen Labradors that look great at 90 pounds, and I've seen Labradors that look great at 50 pounds. So that it can be a little bit hard to tell with some of the different breeds. Um, so this is a really good one to go off of. If you look at their weight history when they were one year old. So the big thing is, though, if they were already overweight when they were one year old. So if they were ideal at one year of age, you're probably fine. But if they were already overweight or obese, then that's not the weight that you want to go off of. 
And then for me, and for your veterinarian, there are a lot of different calculations that we have available where we can actually calculate back what their ideal body weight. So when I'm doing my consults, I'm gonna pull out these calculations. And these calculations, they're always gonna be estimates. And so I always tell owners, what I just told you is an estimate. We're never gonna know until we get there. I have been fooled. I have stopped animals at 80 pounds when I thought they should be 70 pounds because they looked really, really good. So the biggest thing, and we're gonna, we'll talk about this, is to know what this is, it's always about the follow-up. So how to implement a weight loss program. So number one, ask your veterinarian for help. Um, so they can definitely help you in doing some calculations, coming up with what the appropriate amounts to feed are, and, and getting that implemented. So for me, when I'm doing these consults, the things that I need to know is when I need a current body weight, I need to know what their body condition score was. I'm just gonna turn these back up a little bit. I need to actually put my hands on them I need to do their body condition score, and I need to figure out what their body fat percentage is gonna be. Diet history, this is where you guys are really, really, really important, because this is what you're gonna tell me. So we need to know basically every single thing that goes into your animal's mouth. So we wanna know what their main diet, any treats, any supplements, any table foods. Also, we're gonna evaluate their medical history and look at the behavior, the behavioral environmental information that really may change what kind of feeding strategies that we may take on. So a multi-cat household is a huge thing. Um, some things for me that complicate weight loss are concurrent diseases like renal disease or kidney disease. So diet history. So when I ask you guys, what food are you currently feeding? What I really want to know is what the name, what the brand is, what the variety of that brand is, and how much and how frequently you're feeding. So one of the things that I get a lot on my consults is I'm, I'm just feeding Imes. Well, there are probably like 30 different bags of food from Imes. Same thing with Blue Buffalo, same things with Purina, Science Diet. They make tons and tons of different foods. So the more specific you guys can be with us, the better that we're gonna be able to help you. And then looking at the amount. So how much do you feed twice a day? Well, I feed half a cup twice a day. Is that an eight ounce measuring standard cup or is it our 7-Eleven Super Big Gulp cup? <laughs> so it makes a really big difference. And are you using a coffee mug? Well, are you using the big coffee mug that I like to drink out of? Or are you using like a little coffee mug? So it makes a really big difference. And you want to make sure that if you're following the instructions on the bag and they say to feed cup, that you're using an eight ounce measuring cup. All treats, all of them. We want to know about all of the treats. And often I find that even though we're feeding a reasonable amount of the main diet, the thing that got us in trouble is the treats. Table foods, so it's often really hard to account for all the table foods because it's, we eat such a variable diet and a lot of the time when we're giving animals our table foods, it's gonna also be very variable. People don't usually think about this, um, but I'll always ask about this. Are you, when you're giving medications, are you wrapping it in any food? Are you using half a cup of peanut butter when you give it? Which my friend, my best friend from college, I went over to their house and they're complaining about their dogs being overweight and asking if I could help them. And while they go get the medications, they bring it out in a jar of peanut butter and let them lick out of it. And I'm like, okay, well, that's, that's a problem. Uh, and then supplements. So sometimes people don't even think about supplements. But one really big one for me is fish oil. So fish oil is fat. So you're giving them fat. So potentially how big your dog is, we need to account for all of those things. So what do we want to know about everything you're giving? And then the way that I'm gonna implement a weight loss program is then I'm gonna identify the number of calories that I'm gonna to give to your animal. We're gonna pick out all the food. We're gonna talk about treats within reason. And then we're gonna talk about follow-up. So how do we pick the right food? So for me, there are two categories of options. You're gonna have your over-the-counter diets, which are usually gonna be like weight management, light, versus your therapeutic weight loss diets. So some of the differences and the things that make a therapeutic weight loss diet, it's not that just they said, this is our therapeutic weight loss diet that you have to buy from your veterinarian with a prescription. I'm gonna say that this is the only way you can get that. It actually, they are different from over-the-counter diets. So the way that they're different, so if you look at over-the-counter diets, these diets, calorie-wise, are meant to be fed at maintenance energy requirements, even the weight management and even the light formulas. Therapeutic weight loss diets, they are gonna be formulated with the idea of calorie restriction in mind and sometimes and, and significant calorie restriction in mind. Um, Over-the-counter diets, they're going to be complete and balanced, 
and the nutrients are going to be in there for maintenance, maintenance feeding, so feeding at maintenance calories. Therapeutic weight loss diets, you're gonna have this very high nutrient to calorie ratio, which means that the less calories you feed, you shouldn't run into nutritional deficiency. So basically these foods are gonna be fortified so that when we cut them back, we still know that they're gonna get everything that they need. Therapeutic weight loss diets are also gonna have a lot of added fiber to them um, for satiety. There are some weight loss diets for cats, and we're not gonna go into this too much, that are very low carbohydrate foods, which is what I tend to use more often in cats. Um, if they will eat canned food. Um, these are also going to be really, really high protein because when you're undergoing weight loss, you don't want to lose muscle mass. You want to lose the fat. So high protein to maintain that muscle mass. Over-the-counter diets, you're going to have very, a large variable of calorie density. So one cup of food does not equal one cup of food across the board. And you're going to have a really variable fiber content. So some of these diets have very, very little fiber content in them at all. And while some of them may have a whole lot of fiber content in them. So for me, when I'm doing a weight loss plan, I require that all obese patients going on aggressive weight loss plans go on a therapeutic weight loss diet. Because if I use an over-the-counter diet, we may run into nutritional deficiencies. And so for me, it is a requirement when I am doing these consults. They don't have to stay on it forever. They just have to get down to a healthier body weight before we can switch them back over to a better, to a, a food um, that they can stay on long term. Overweight animals, so when you're looking at that body condition score of six to seven out of nine, these are times when we can consider talking about light or weight management formulas and we can still do some calorie restriction. I generally am more conservative with the calorie restriction I'll do for these guys. So I'm not doing aggressive weight management with them. Um, but it is possible when you have just an overweight animal to do that. Um, I will say that I often find though that even if they're just overweight and we're really trying, to, especially I would say there are times when we're really, really pushing to get weight loss over, off of them. One, mobility is a big thing. They just can't get up and move around. If you can just take a few of those pounds off them, it usually makes a big difference for them. Um, so sometimes with these guys, I, I will even go ahead and put them on a therapeutic weight loss diet so we can just more rapidly and efficiently get the weight off of them. So treats. Yes, your animal can still receive treats. I will allow your animals when they're on a weight loss plan to still get them, but Lots of buts with this one. When we calculate out their calories, only 10% of treats, calories, can only 10% of the calories can come from treats. So if I tell you that your animal can only eat 400 calories a day, that means that they can only have 40 calories from treats. And I'm usually pretty strict about this. Um, and in all of my consults that I've done for weight loss, which I've done quite a few at this point, I think this is the biggest reason why it fails, is because often we, are, we have treats that go unaccounted for. And there's a lot of different reasons for that. And we'll talk about that. And we'll talk about ways to fix that. So how do I identify, so kcal content, so calories, basically calorie equals one kcal. So we want you guys to be able to identify calorie content on a label. And so the way that it's going to be listed on pet food labels, it's going to be listed under KCAL versus if you look at a human label, it's going to be calorie with a capital C. They're exactly the same thing. So the way that you get calorie information is there's really three ways that you can get it right now. I will tell you that in 2017, the grace period is over for the pet food companies and everyone, including treats, will have to have calorie information on the labels, which is huge and awesome. Um, so, but right now, in the meantime, in the next couple years, the way that you can get calorie information is you can look on the label. It may not always be on the label. I don't actually on canned food. I very rarely see it on canned food. You can look at the website or you can call the manufacturer. Usually calling the manufacturer is usually kind of the, the most inconvenient thing to do. But if you can't find it and you call the manufacturer and they don't know, you should probably just put that food back on the shelf because in my opinion, all pet food companies and treat manufacturers should know exactly what's in their food. So identifying the KCAL content on the label. So it's gonna be listed usually in two ways. So it's going to have the KCAL and this ME, all this ME means is metabolizable energy. So the amount of energy that they can metabolize from this food. And it's going to be per cup or per can in the 
the United States. If you go to Europe, you may only, you're only probably going to see this, which is going to be the cake house of metabolizable energy per kilogram. Interestingly, the way that a lot of pet owners in other countries feed their animals is they don't use standard cup measurements. Um, they, a lot of pet owners will actually weigh it on a gram scale, um, which I actually have a few weight loss consoles where that's what I've, we've resorted to because we're making such fine adjustments and there can be a huge difference between half a cup and a fourth of a cup and even a third of a cup. So sometimes I'll actually have owners purchase a gram scale and weigh it so that we know what we're getting. And this is just a nice reminder that one cup equals an eight fluid ounce cup if you're going to use a cup. All right, so table foods. This is for me, I almost can never account for all the calories from table foods. Most of the time, I try to get a rough idea, and I'm like, are you giving table foods? Yep, I'm giving table foods every day, every day. In general, how much? Usually, I can't even account for the calories that are coming from here. But it's usually a significant amount, I find. Um, so looking at the KCAL content of table foods. so. You can usually, if you have calorie information of what you're feeding available, you can always go off of that. There's also this website, and, and you can also Google um, the USDA nutrient database. Um, and so this is what this link is for. And what you're going to find when you go onto the USDA nutrient beta database, so this is just a search I did yesterday. So I wanted to know how many calories was in peanut butter and smooth peanut butter without added salt. And so it's going to give you all of these tables. And so as nutritionists and uh, even people and human nutritionists, this is where we're going to get a lot of our information from. So energy, so you're, here's your kcal again, which again equals one calorie. And so for two tablespoons of peanut butter, there are 188 calories, which I eat a lot of peanut butter. So I felt kind of bad when I saw this. And one cup of peanut butter, 1,500 calories. So Animals usually are not going to be eating near this much, but I find that often when owners are giving peanut butter, they're giving like two or three tablespoons. That can add up so fast. So we need to account for all of those things that we're giving. So looking now at energy intake and activity on VSOG, so this is kind of transitioning a little bit into exercise and some things that we know. So this is a study looking at 35 client-owned dogs that were all classified as overweight or obese. And all of these dogs were fed a therapeutic weight loss diet to maintain a rate of weight loss of 2% of their body weight per week, which is ideal. We want usually around 1% to 2% of their body weight per week is what we're looking for. And all of these dogs had a little color-mounted pedometer that they got to wear and run around in. Um, so dogs that were, act dogs were defined as active if they took 7,250 steps a day. And what was interesting, and again, all of these dogs are losing at the same rate, but active dogs had a significantly higher intake, so they got to eat more food. And active and inactive dogs, they both, again, same rate of weight loss. The active dogs were able to lose weight while eating more. And for each 1,000 steps, that was one calorie um, per metabolize, per their, uh, I'm sorry, per kig based on their metabolic body weight. So we'll have to, we have to do a little conversion when we're talking about metabolic body weight. But for every 1,000 steps they took, if they were 50 kgs based on their uh, metabolic body weight, um, they lost one kcal. And this was equal to about 2.5 miles per day. So the moral of the story is, with this study, is you want to try to find ways to increase exercise as well. So exercising dogs. My general kind of blanket recommendation for dogs is to try to increase activity by 15 to 20 minutes per day if you can. This is really hard because of the, like this winter, like nobody got outside. I didn't want to go outside. Um, so you have to try to be creative and think about other things. I put indoor pool up there because I just thought, wouldn't that be nice if we all had that? Um, but indoor playtime. So try to think of ways that you can interact with your dog for maybe just 15 to 20 minutes more a day. And in more advanced cases, and we'll, I'll show you guys some examples. We may even get into physical rehab, especially with these animals that have limited mobility and they have a really hard time walking around, but we need to do some type of physical activity with them. And the underwater treadmill is a great way to do that. And it's something that we have here at Red Bank. Cat exercise, super hard. Like, I'm not gonna lie. My cat, there is no way. She is like, 
She's an old lady, so I give her a little bit of an excuse, but you gotta get creative sometimes with these guys. I'm not expecting everyone to build a hamster wheel, but it is pretty clever. Two cats. <laughs> laser pointer. So the laser pointer is a great way. They're, I feel like cats are such suckers for laser pointers. They love it. Um, so sometimes looking at increasing the vertical space. So making them have to climb to get up to their food. So do you have, if you have stairs in their house and they usually eat downstairs, now feed them upstairs or feed them one of their meals downstairs. So they actually are forced to go get their food. Um, just playing with their cat. So looking at the laser pointer, like we talked about, cats sometimes can be little scavengers. So you maybe have multiple bowls set up in different places in the house where they have to like scavenge to try to get them. And that's very interactive for them as well. Um, making them work for their food. So my own cat, I have these little um, dental kibbles and I throw them across my kitchen and she runs and gets them and then she brings them back to me. So this is my way of keeping her, yeah, she, well, she eats them and then she comes back for more. So she doesn't bring them back to me. But um, this is just my way of having some enrichment for her and she loves it. She's very food motivated. So follow up, again, the key for me to a successful weight loss program. So there's lots of different factors that go into a weight loss program and I can give you all of these recommendations from the very beginning. But if we never follow up, we're never gonna know if it's working or we're never gonna know um, if the rate of weight loss is appropriate Maybe we're losing too fast, which can be dangerous in some animals like cats. Or maybe we're losing really, really slow and we think we can be more efficient. Um, so following up is a great opportunity to adjust feeding orders um, and to also troubleshoot any issues. So just sitting down and talking to your veterinarian and be like, listen, I'm trying to do this, but this is what's happening. And how can we think of a solution together that we can fix that? So initially, at the first recheck appointment, so when you guys bring your animal into the vet, talk about weight loss, get a plan together with your veterinarian, um, we want to we want to see you back in about two weeks because we want to make sure that that's work, it's what the plan that we implemented that it's working well and we don't need to make any changes from the beginning. Generally, after that, I say usually monthly is fine. I don't like to put animals on the scale too frequently because one, their rate of weight loss it's not going to be. You're not looking at, you know, more than like a pound or something. This is not the biggest loser where animals are going to, where people, animals are going to lose like 30 pounds in like one week, which is ridiculous. Um, but, you know, we want to keep them at a safe rate of weight loss. And so I don't usually like to put them on the scale every week, mostly because I don't want to keep, get you guys disappointed with the progress because it is still progress. But usually weight loss programs to be successful if they're obese is usually going to take six months to a year. So the rate of weight loss that we're looking for, one to two percent of their body weight per week. In cats, cats can go a little bit slower. About half of a percent to one percent of their body weight per week is acceptable. So this dog, her name is English Meadow. She is a, which is a great name. Um, she is very mean though. Um, <laughs> her, um, she was a roller coaster of being obese and being thin and being obese and being thin. And it was always, and so what we would do is we would actually keep her in the hospital for a while, get her started on weight loss, get her down to a body weight, and then what would happen is everyone in the family would fall off the wagon, and then we would go back to old habits. And she had such a slow metabolism that it took almost nothing to get her back up to here. And so in her situation, it's, it's overfeeding. And so whenever these are failing, it's, it's always usually the result from overfeeding. And generally before we're going to do weight loss or we have a really obese animal, we're going to try and screen them for many metabolic issues that may be predisposing them for this issue. So some of the things for weight loss failure is, you know, for us in the beginning, for veterinarians and for me is, did I have an inaccurate ideal body weight in mind? Um, is my food dose calculation, is it wrong? Like one, because maybe I didn't have the right ideal body weight calculated. Um, miscommunication of food dose. So where I find that this happens is not so much in the exam room between the owner and the, and the veterinarian, but for the whole family. So we have to get, always get the whole family on board whenever we're doing something like this. Um, food measurement error. So I told you to feed one cup, but now we're feeding one big gold cup. Um, just the owner commitment. These behaviors, so family feeding behaviors, sometimes it's really hard to, to and, and it's always training us ourselves to. Um, same thing I had to do with my cat. So I was so used to my cat always begging for food and leaving food out all the time, and now taking it up and having to meal feed her and having to deal with that begging behavior. So I was training myself and my husband as well. 
Um, and then just the pet physiology. So, you know, in a case like this with English Meadow, although this, this was never an issue for her, she didn't have hypothyroidism, but sometimes when we've done weight loss and we've been really successful and now we're having trouble keeping it off, now we may need to go back and screen them for something like this because maybe they developed it. So this is for you guys, some of the things that you can think about. Go ahead. Exactly, same thing, same thing. That's an eight ounce, um, anything that you buy like from the store that has one cup on it, that's what we're talking about. And so if you put water in there, it would weigh eight ounces. So it's not, so the biggest thing is we're not talking about a weight. So and act like uh, actually if you get on the scale and weigh yourself, we're just talking about the, the volume. Um, so uh, which there, it can, and that's generally how most people in the United States are going to measure their food. It's a little bit different um, in other countries, again, because they may use the weight of the food. Um, but in here, for the most part, we're usually talking about the volume. Um, so looks hungry begging. This happens a lot. So animals, some of them are super, super food motivated. And they're going to come in the kitchen, and they're going to stand next to you, and they're going to look at you, and they're going to be like, Hi, I'm super cute. Please feed me. And <laughs> and my animals, they do it to me all the time. But you would think that after this many years that they would know that there is no way they're asking the worst person in the world to give them treats. Um, so sometimes this isn't so much. This, not, this isn't for every animal. For a lot of animals, this isn't about the food. Sometimes it's about the attention. And uh, I should have put this in there, but food does not equal love. Food is not love. Some of this is very attention-seeking behavior. And even if they are food-seeking, you can turn it into attention. So now we're going to pay you back, and you look really adorable, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a scratch on the head. So offering a social or activity substitute, so playing, grooming, walking, or giving them some type of affection. Um, sometimes if this is about food, maybe you're going to have a portion so you want to feed two you need to feed two cups of food a day i'm going to keep a fourth of the cup separate so every time you come in here and you beg me for food i'm going to give you a little bit of it so distributing a portion of the diet as treats instead of meals um, dividing into more frequent smaller meals um, using this as a salary that they must earn so using the actual kibble itself um, as a reward in training um, and that's part of their diet um, giving them some type of environmental enrichment. So there's lots of products on the market now that are really fun, um, like little food balls and uh, little mazes when they eat out of them. Um, and then sometimes, especially when you're eating dinner, sometimes you just got to put them in the other room, put them outside, um, because it's not going to stop. And if it, this is where a big problem is, is, we're trying to get everybody in the family on board with not giving them table food. When is that going to happen? It's going to happen during dinner, and we're all sitting at the table eating. So sometimes you just got to put them in the other room. So misbehavior. <laughs> I love dog shaming. Dog shaming is really fun uh, when you look at the things on the internet. So trash rating. So this is again a lot of these issues that you're coming. You want to troubleshoot these problems, and how can we fix this? So giving them more physical activity or more environmental enrichment or identifying solutions that are going to inhibit that misbehavior, putting baby locks on the cupboards, um, using a trash bin that has a cover on it, um, putting up barriers to keep them away. Cats, they're nocturnal, so sometimes they're going to drive owners crazy at night. Um, I'm not advising anyone to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and feed your cat. There are better ways to do that. Um, so um, I think we all need to sleep through the night. But automatic feeders, especially if you're feeding dry food, set the automatic feeder to go off in the middle of the night if they're driving you crazy. Um, if you're using canned food, you want to be a little bit careful with the automatic feeders because you want to make some of these, you want to look for one that's going to be temperature controlled um, where you can put like the ice packs in it. Um, and those are available, and you can use those if you're going to feed in the middle of the night and you want them to get a portion of their canned food. Also, these little toy, little toy balls. So this is made by a company called PetSafe, um, and basically the animal has to move it around the house um, to have the kibble fall out of it so that you can eat it. And it's, again, it's uh, working, for your, working for your food, so really trying to earn it. And these are, can be really helpful with cats. Insufficient exercise, so find a friend and maybe have a social group, so a dog walking group to get you guys out. You know, even if it's just once a week for 30 minutes, doing something. Um, so 
um, looking into things like daycare, pet sitter services, hiring the kid across the street to come over and walk your dog. When I was in college, I actually did that for a pet owner whose animals were really, really ob overweight and obese. And he hired me for an entire summer to come walk his dogs every single summer. It was while I was at the vet clinic. Um, and it was great because his dogs got lean and I got to be outside every day and it was really fun. Um, cats, again, laser pointer, putting the food in areas where they have to work to get it so they have to jump up high or, or climb something to get it. Multi-pet households, so what's gonna happen in multi-pet households? Food sharing and stealing especially if they're all fed together. Um, and cats in particular, if you're just feeding out of one bowl, they were never, we don't know how much each cat is getting. Um, so trying to separate their, trying to meal feed them and separate out into separate bowls, and this can be really, really, really hard. Um, but sometimes, again, it takes a little bit of creative thought to figure out how this is best gonna work. If possible, if you're putting one cat on a therapeutic weight loss diet, go ahead and put all of the cats on the therapeutic weight loss diet if they, if they don't have another medical reason not to be, and just feed them more so that they don't lose weight. Um, you can separate pets on physical abilities. So I have a picture of this. So a box with a hole in it for the small cat to get in where the big cat can't get into it. Um, or if it's dogs getting into cat food, put the cat food up high. So now the cat can jump up high and get it. So my cat, I have a spare chopping block that I took from my mother's garage sitting on one side of the, that's her, that's where she eats. And she has to jump up and eat on it, otherwise my dog would eat all of it. Um, and then looking at potentially specific products that might restrict access. So I have a picture of this crate. Actually, somebody made this. I found this on the internet. It's just a Tupperware box. They bought this little cat door that's magnetic so that the only, the ca only one cat, uh, a specific cat can go in and eat. It's probably the skinny one. Um, and so the, the, the big cat can't get in there. Maybe a thing to do with the dogs as well. If they're super destructive dogs, then maybe not, because I bet you they would try to get in there. Um, so the other thing, the pet won't eat the diet. So if we switch them to a therapeutic weight loss diet, the good news is there are tons of different options out there. So all of the, uh, all of the pet food companies that make therapeutic diets, they all make a weight loss plan. We have lots of different options, things that we can switch to. Um, if it's a palatability issue, um, using the treat allowance and putting that on, so if they, you want to use like applesauce or um, little bits of chicken um, or cheese or yogurt or something as a palatability enhancer, you can use that, but it has to be out of your treat allowance. Gradually introducing the new food, so just don't cold turkey. Um, spend your, go about a week, um, spend about a week transitioning them. In cats, what you can do is offer the new food just side by side. So you don't necessarily have to mix it. You can mix it, but another strategy would just be have the other food sitting out for a week, just so that they can get used to the idea that you're about to put them on a diet. So just have it sitting out, have them get used to it, and then just gradually start to remove the other food. And it, sometimes cats are gonna kind of go back and forth and graze a little bit at both of the options. And then this is a big one. If your pet is holding out on the hope that they're going to be really cute and you're going to give, you are going to give them something, you need to make them wait and you need to make them realize that they, you need, they need to hold out. So you don't want to do this, I would say this is for dogs too, you don't want to make them go like 24 hours without food. But what I find a lot when I talk to owners and they're like, he won't eat the diet. And I'm like, well, how long did you wait before you gave him his old diet? Well, he turned his nose up at it, so I just put the new food down, or the old food down. Mm -mm. Then they don't, they don't get to eat that meal and then you need to get them hungry and feed them the next meal. So again, you don't want to do that more than about a day, um, but you want to make them realize that, that their old diet, uh, which whatever that diet consisted of, that now we're going to transition to a new diet. Some dogs are really smart, and they're going to wait, and they're going to hold out because they know. This happens really commonly, so the weight loss plateau. <laughs> so a lot of times when we're doing a weight loss plan, we get to a point where we're not seeing any progress anymore, and I think this happens in almost every case that I've had. Um, and it's because the metabolic, things are happening to them metabolically and they're having basically resetting where their, where their metabolism is that, to get you, for them to be able to lose more weight. And so a lot of times when this happens, we have to adjust, make adjustments either in their calorie 
intake or their energy expenditure. So if we're plateauing, well, let's increase their exercise or let's cut back their food. Some animals, I can't cut back their food anymore because of the negative behaviors associated with begging and it, it just is something that it can't, you, know, you can't tolerate it all day long. Um, so sometimes in that case, we're gonna talk about inter, um, increasing the energy expenditure. Um, and in these cases, we might consider a physical rehab program. All right, so I told you we're gonna talk about Mabel. So this is Miss Babel. Um, when I was a resident at the University of Tennessee, I came into work in one day in January. I had three people. I knew that I was getting this dog, that she was going to come and stay with me for two weeks. And she was actually just surrendered to the shelter. Um, and she was super sweet. And they needed somebody. They, they wanted to try to get weight off of her. And they thought, well, there's a resident over at Tennessee, and she will probably be really helpful, and they'll probably do it at a super discounted price because I'm the resident. So she was, my, she was a teaching case for me. So she came in at the shelter at 67 pounds. And so this is her. She's actually about six pounds less in this picture. And we calculated her body fat percentage to be probably around 70%. So I had three people come to me in the hallway before I ever saw her and tell me that this is the fattest dog they've ever seen in their life. And then I came and I saw her, and I was like, yep fattest dog I've ever seen in my life. I called my mentors and they came down and they were like, yep, that's definitely the fattest dog we've ever seen. So we don't know how she got to that point, but the reason why she was turned into the shelter is because she couldn't walk anymore because she was so big. So we started her immediately on a weight loss plan. These are just some other pictures of her. She was very immobile um, whenever she would walk. She could only take just a few steps at a time and then she would have to sit down. So I would really equate her and you know, when we see on TV, like the 600, 700 pound person, when we calculate it out, you know, this, this is about what we're talking about. So this does happen. Uh, it's really unfortunate. So with Mabel, we calculated, so remember she was 67 pounds. I calculated her ideal body weight to be 22.5 pounds. And I was like, is this right? Because I feel like that's a lot of weight that for her to lose. And I, I don't wanna be overdoing it here, but we all agreed that this is probably about what she should weigh. We said that she should eat 400 calories per day. So we put her on a weight loss plan. So 360 calories per day as a therapeutic weight loss, and then 40 calories per day in treats. And then we started her exercise regimen. So this is her on the underwater treadmill. So for two weeks, we ran her twice a day for 10 minutes initially, and we built her up. Um, to be on this underwater treadmill to get her started. So the, the best, best part about this story is she got adopted by my mentor. Um, so she ended up coming back and being able to do the underwater treadmill. She actually has a Facebook page too. <laughs> um, so, and she's like a local celebrity. Here she is. All right. She looks amazing, but look, we're not even done. She was 30% body fat in this picture. And so she was um, about a little less than 30 pounds. And at this point, we cut her food back to 200 calories a day. And that's what it was taking to keep her to continue to lose weight. Here's the end. So this was April 2013. She is 23 pounds. We were like, that half pound is probably all that extra skin. <laughs> so we were like, she looks great. We thought she was probably about 22% body fat. And so you can do it. It can work. So this is April 2013, so we started January 2012, so over a year. We don't know. We think that she was probably about four or five. She was very young. So some of the things that Mabel encountered on her road to weight loss is that she had torn cruciates, and she was so obese initially that it was too risky to put her under anesthesia. Um, so we had to wait until her, she lost more weight so that she could be a better anesthetic candidate before the surgeon could go in and fix her knees. Um, she also has a lot of dermatologic issues, even now. So this is a skin fold that probably won't ever go away. Um, but she has a lot of issues with that. Um, she also has chronic urinary tract infections, which now are much, much better. But it was something that my mentor um, had to deal with through a good portion of her weight loss program. Um, because a lot of animals that are overweight, um, because of just the an change in anatomy, um, if particularly female dogs, uh, will develop urinary tract infections. All right, so prevention. This is a little bit of a shorter part. Best thing you can do, start when they're little. Think about it when you adopt them, even. 
Um, so you, with puppies and kittens, you're, the maintenance of a healthy body weight, you want to just start them out. If they, you want them to look ideal from the time they're young up until, up until the end. So after spaying and neutering, one of the things is that their daily energy requirement potentially may decrease by 20%. Um, and again, that's because we're, we're not having all of those sex hormones circulating anymore that are going to be very involved with energy expenditure. So at that point, once your animal becomes spayed and neutered, you may want to consider cutting back by up to 20%. If, the, if your puppy or kitten is about 80% of their expected adult weight, then that's a time when I would consider transitioning them off puppy and kitten food, which is going to be really calorie dense. So that's one of the characteristics of puppy and kitten food is there's a lot of fat in it because they need a lot of energy so that they can grow. But once they start to get an adult, uh, about 80% of their, you can start to switch them. And that's going to be, and especially in dog breeds, going to be super variable. Yeah, so normally we say a year, however, Giant breed dogs, Great Danes, Newfoundlands, Great Pyrenees, these guys can go much longer, Mastiffs. Some of these guys can go 14 to 18 months. Um, so even when they're a year of age, you may still not be wanting to switch them over to an adult food. Very small breed dogs like Chihuahuas and Yorkies and Maltese, these guys may be even sooner than a year. They may be at a mature body weight by the time they're by the time they're um, eight to 10 months of age. Um, so it just kind of depends. And sometimes knowing a little about the parents, we're not always gonna know. And if you, if you adopt a, a mixed breed dog, change them at a year, unless they're gigantic. Yeah, like a golden or Labrador, probably about a year of age, it's gonna be fine. Yep, that's gonna be a good number to keep in your mind for them. So if they weigh 60 pounds at a year, and, they ha and your veterinarian at the annual says that they have an ideal body condition. And this is something you can do. You can ask your vet, what do you think about my animal's body condition? Are they overweight? Are they too thin? Like, what do we need to do? So you can ask them. Adult animals, you want to feed to be lean. So that body condition score, four out of nine, is what you're kind of looking for. So how much to feed? So you can, there are guidelines on the bag. So what I like to say about the guidelines on the bag is that these are guidelines. And some animals, if you feed them to the guidelines, they may become very, very overweight. Some animals, that may not be enough for them. So for me, you can look at the bag, but it's a starting point. And you want to adjust. So if you see your animal starting to become overweight or big, if you're feeding them two cups a day, feed them one and three-fourths cups a day and see if that kind of does the trick. So you may have to wait a couple months. but. so much. It's still all about the daily calorie intake. Generally for cats, you know, if you can feed them more frequently, that's probably better because they tend, you know, to be uh, animals that in the wild are going to eat small frequent meals. That's not practical for everybody. My cat gets fed twice a day and she's just going to have to deal with that even though she wants to be fed more. So. Well, I have a two hour lecture about that. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, Yep. Well, they're also greyhounds, and I'm not sure that I have ever seen a fat greyhound in my life. So I have seen fat Italian greyhounds, which always kind of blows my mind, the little guys. Um, so it's not about the type of diet. It's not if it's canned, raw, dry. It's going to be about the calorie intake, because I have seen plenty of animals on a raw food diet that are really fat because a lot of things, was, so some of the characteristics of raw food diets is they're going to be very, very low in carbohydrate. So you're, not, you're going to be feeding them lots of protein and fat. And fat is going to have more than twice the amount of calories as protein and carbohydrate. So that's generally, I, I've seen a lot of, it's not about the type of diet. So. Um, so also, you know, having some type of exercise or activity for them. Um, behavior training. So lots of owners will are they'll have trainers and they'll do behavior training and they're going to use treats, lots of lots of rewards for treats, and all of those treats can really really add up. So if you're going to do that, use really really low calorie treats, or you do clicker training, or give them affection or praise when they're doing this. 
So, um, mini marshmallows, mini marshmallows, they're like one calorie. And again, it's not about the food, it's about the interaction that you're having with your animal. Um, green beans, little baby carrots, all of these are low calorie rewards you can consider. Um, looking for that kcal content of the label. If you don't see the kcal content on the label, you can't find it, then just go find something else. There's plenty of other options out there. And then over time, as you go back into your veterinarian year after year, you want to monitor that weight trend and be proactive and address weight gain early so that we're not getting into a situation, not that I've seen many dogs like Mabel ever, but you don't want to get into a situation where you have, like the Franny, who is, who is at the top end of obese, where we have to backtrack now. Also looking at seasonal temperature extremes, this is you know no joke for us up here this winter. Um, it was really hard for people to get out, so be creative and try to think of things that you could do in your house. Same thing for when it gets really, really hot. So there are some dogs that just can't tolerate all of that heat, so like bulldogs, we don't want to get them outside. And then looking at your animal as they age, so a lot of things are going to happen when they get older that are going to affect metabolic rate and activity. And a lot of times you may want to be consider switching to a less calorie dense food if you're struggling with their weight. A lot of the senior formulated diets are usually going to be less calorie dense. But again, you want to make sure that you're looking at the calorie content because it's not going to be a rule of thumb across the board. So the senior label on dog food, it isn't something that is like a regulated term. So it's going to be significant for whatever the company thinks it's significant for. All right, so obesity services at Red Bank. So I'm Dr. Klein. Dr. Murphy is our other board certified nutritionist. I will just brag on her for a second. She is flying to Tennessee tomorrow to be awarded a PhD um, for her work with weight loss and satiety in dogs. So she is really impressive because she's a doctor two times. So she's also crazy for doing that, but that's fine. <laughs> um, so what we'd have is you're gonna have your initial consult with one of us. And then you're going to get six monthly weight recheck appointments. And so that's all inclusive in the package. I'm also gonna write you up a weight loss plan very specific for your pets. And your first bag or case of veterinary food is going to be free, kind of free. It's $336. <laughs> um, but again, that includes six months um, of follow-up from us. So the future of what we're thinking about um, and something that we hope to have implemented by 2015 as an obesity clinic. We're gonna combine our clinical nutrition and our physical rehab services so that we can see more things like this happen. Um, so we really wanna work on getting packages together where we can do underwater treadmill and you know have our own little obesity clinic here at Red Bank. And so that's something that we're working on. It does, there are some other programs that have that, um, but, but we wanna have it too, so. Anyways, be on the lookout for that. Um, Veterinarian-wise, if you, all of your veterinarians can help you with weight loss. Um, if you guys want to make an appointment with your veterinarian, you want to make sure specifically you're going in because you want to talk about how to lose weight. Um, because a lot of times it takes a while to calculate all of these things out. Um, and so don't be afraid to just go talk to your veterinarian about ways that, that we can help them um, achieve a better body condition. Um, so this is where I got a lot of references from today, so I just wanted to put that in there. Um, AHA, uh, which is the um, American Animal Hospital Association, they have weight management guidelines for cats and dogs. And like I said, 15, actually 15 on May 1st, um, and that's my dog. And they're both ideal body condition. So, all right. Kind of sure. We have one dog. Yep. And I, we have one dog that likes to eat grass. We, we've never been able to get an answer to these questions. Yeah. So my dog eats grass. Yeah. And sometimes this is just a behavior that animals are going to have. And it doesn't mean that they have a nutritional deficiency. Um, a lot of times it just is a behavior that they have because maybe it tastes good to them. I don't know. Um, sometimes they just like it. Oh, rabbit poop. Rabbit poop is very palatable for dogs. Let me just, I know this is disgusting, but it is. Um, so, you know, there, there are some dogs that do have issues 
um, that will eat a lot of things that are inappropriate, and we would call that pica. Um, grass eating, I don't know why. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Um, my dog eats grass every time I take her outside, and she doesn't have any issues, so yeah, I just kind of let it happen. Well, that's the other issue, too. My cat also, if she gets outside, she eats grass, and then she comes and pukes on my house, so I'm on my carpet, so I don't let her outside. Um, but I don't have a good answer for you why they're doing that. Well, what we do um, now is we muzzle them. That's the thing. So a big thing is that there are going to be a lot of calories and feces. And if this is a big problem when they go outside in, their, in your yard and they're just foraging for whatever they can find and they're getting a lot of amount of calories from that, I have had owners use basket muzzles when they go outside. And it's not because they're mean or anything. And of course, the muzzles have this terrible perception. But if it's in your own backyard, you know, that is, that's one way to keep them from eating inappropriate things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, cat poop is also like a prized possession among dogs. So, you know, it's not ab it's not abnormal. Um, what else you got? <laughs> Yeah, so um, grain-free does not mean carbohydrate-free. Oh, is it a benefit or not? So right now, grain-free is more of a marketing thing than anything. What we saw happen in the nutrition world is that there were a lot of grain-free gluten things happening on in human nutrition, and it has trickled into the veterinary world. There are no studies that show that grain-free is better. And we don't know why it started, but it is a huge money maker in the pet pet world. Um, so that's why we see it. So when we talk about cats and obesity, though, um, for me, when I have an obese cat, because they're going to be different. So cats are not small dogs. Um, some of these cats do better when we put them on. We quote unquote call it catkins. So it's a very high protein, very low carbohydrate diet. And the reason why is because cats are true carnivores. So dogs are omnivores, we're omnivores, cats are true carnivores. So they are adapted to eat a really, really high protein, really high fat diet. They can still digest carbohydrate, and there are still times in their life when maybe carbohydrate may be of a benefit for them. But for weight loss, if they will eat a canned diet, I will usually put them on a low carbohydrate diet. So if you buy grain-free over, the one thing, of some of the grain-free cat foods are going to be low carbohydrate, but not all of them. So a lot of times they're going to replace it with another starch, so like pea or our potato. Um, so for me, there's no benefit of moving to a grain-free diet for weight loss. Um, what about a high fiber cat food? High fiber cat foods. So if cats will only eat dry food, and I can only get them to eat dry food, then I will use a high fiber diet. Because if you use that other principle, so now you're gonna use a really high protein, really high fat diet to get them to lose weight. When it's in a can, you can dilute that out with water. But if you're using that with dry, you're gonna have, they're gonna eat an eighth of a teaspoon. They're gonna, or they're gonna eat an eighth of a cup. They're in, that all their calories are gonna be jam packed in there. So if they're only eating dry food, then I absolutely, I'll go to a really high fiber diet for them. Because then they can eat more, they can feel fuller. Um, animals are generally going to be satiated and feel full with higher protein and higher amounts of fiber. How much protein is too much? Because like I'm feeding my dog a grain free kibble mm -hmm. and I could get like 38% protein and like 15% fat. Is that okay or is it too much? Yeah, so the limit, so there are some limitations with pet food labels. So when you look at that percentage, that percentage is going to be the guaranteed analysis is going to be the minimum amount of protein that's available, and it's also going to include water content. So if the water content varies from canned food to even amongst dry foods and different forms of foods, you can actually look at that number and be able to compare them across the board. So the way that I generally look at food to understand the protein content, and unfortunately this is things that are not available on the bag, um, and you're going to want to look at the number of calories that come from protein per the gram of food. 
um, or per the calories of food. So that's not answering your question though. Um, how much protein is too much protein? So for me, the only times that you're gonna be giving them too much protein is if they have an underlying disease. So if they have kidney disease, those are gonna be times where we're gonna wanna talk about avoiding really high protein. Um, and some dogs that have liver disease, they can't tolerate high amounts of protein. So I'm not super worried about the protein contents of the food. The biggest thing is even looking at the percentage, uh, if you compare a lot of those to the therapeutic weight loss diets, the therapeutic weight loss diets are even higher than that. Um, because again, they're gonna be fortified um, so that we can make sure that we're not causing a protein deficiency um, when we're cutting them back. Does that, did that answer your question? Yeah, I'm just trying to get a sense. Yeah, so I can't give you a percentage number because it's going to vary across the board. Um, when I look at the bag of food, I'll usually take that percentage and I'll convert that guaranteed analysis into numbers that I can work with. Um, usually, again, it's gonna be the percent metabolizable energy. So if that's something that any of you guys are interested in doing, there's actually a tool online. It's at a website called Balance It, B-A-L-A-N-C-E-I-T, dot com. And what you can do, you take the guaranteed analysis of any food um, what you're going to do on that website is you're going to go to tools and you're going to look at the guaranteed analysis converter. And then you're going to put in all of those numbers from your guaranteed analysis. You're going to hit calculate. You're going to come up with three numbers. The percent of metabolizable energy from protein, from fat, and from carbohydrate. And generally for me, I consider a diet to be high protein. I have to do the math in my head, which is a little bit hard. Probably when you're getting to about 28% and around there. Moderate protein is maybe about 20%. Um, so less than 20% is going to be low protein. You actually can't sell those diets really over the counter because of the AFCO regulation. Um, so everything you buy over the counter is going to be either moderate or high protein. What about carbohydrates? Yeah. that should be low. Well, it depends. So, uh, what percentage? It depends. Would you, uh, would you say on a canned food label? On a canned food label, uh -huh. you're probably looking for about less than 10 percent of, of metabolizable energy. So it has to be converted. Um, there are a number of fancy feast products that are very, very low carbohydrate, um, a pretty large amount. Um, so that's just one company that I have a brand that I found that makes a lot of low carbohydrate foods for cats. Um, now those junkers or canned foods are both? Canned only. Yeah, you're probably feeding some low carbohydrate foods to your cat. Yeah. Um, and then fat content wise, you're looking at about, again, probably about 24, 25% you're gonna be more tending to a low fat diet of metabolizable energy. What's your question? Two things, number one, I've discovered, I have three dogs. Uh -huh. Okay, so always trying to juggle. Both breeds, we're in a picture, golden and proper. Yep. Okay. Um, <laughs> I've found searching online for the recognizing the, the um, calculators of how many kilocalories mm -hmm. they should be having are wildly different. Yep. You can go to 10 different sites and get 10 different calculations. And unfortunately, the one I had been using that I thought was right helped our little cocker get up to a six to seven out of nine. Okay. You know, it was, yeah. it just had him eating too much. Um, second thing though is, so one of my Goldens has lymphoma. Mm -hmm. And, um, the, uh, we, I was switching her to grain free because studies show they do better with higher fats and protein and less of carbs and all this. And eventually I switched the other dogs too, so we were all on the same. Yeah. And, and that's when I was trying to figure out how much the copper should have. But we had an interesting side effect with the grain free. Um, the copper has a thyroid issue. And before it was diagnosed, he could never lose weight. Yep. He just was gaining weight, gaining weight, and we couldn't get him to lose. And as soon as he went on thyroid medication, he lost it. Um, and then he started gaining it back again. And that's when we saw that it was the kilocalorie calculation. Mm -hmm. But, 
because of the thyroid medication, uh, he was like, metabolizing his food too quickly and throwing it part way through the day. Mm -hmm. So he ended up getting a cat food heater to give him food for the day. As soon as he went to bed free, that stopped. So it was, we got one behavior that was great and that he stopped throwing out because it was low glycemic and it was holding him for longer, but he was gaining weight. Yep. So it's been a really, so we're actually working with Dr. Harvey trying to oh, good. get him balanced down there. But it was very strange. The, the great creek could give a good result. Yeah. But it also seemed like it was making him gain weight more. Yep. Maybe that's because of the extra things they It may be. It may be that the food that you were feeding was a um, higher fat food. Um, and so the amount that you were feeding were causing him to gain weight. Um, sometimes, you know, sometimes dogs, they just don't tolerate a food and they will have intermittent vomiting or intermittent loose stool on the food. And sometimes, this is like our dream, it's, it's the easiest thing you can do is just switch to another food and it fixes the problem. That doesn't always happen. I never see those cases because by the time they make it to me, it's way past that. Um, but, you know, potentially the, the new food that you were feeding, there were maybe just properties to it that he was able to tolerate better. So uh, potentially a change in digestibility or something. So. All right, guys. She's weighed, what, did you say nine pounds? She's about nine and a half pounds. Yeah. Cats generally should weigh between like eight and 12 pounds. Some bigger cats, maybe like 13 pounds, um, but probably obese. Yeah, overweight, obese. Um, my record is 34 pounds. It's not good. So, Can I very bad. Are yeah. there any red flag ingredients that you should pick up you know, on those cat food bags that you should stay away from? So, I'm going to say no. Because it's not about ingredients, it's about the nutrients that you get from those ingredients. Um, so probably what you're asking, or what everybody wants to know, is like fillers like grain and corn. Um, so that's what they're kind of labeled out as fillers. Um, and that they're, they're, the, they're kind of promoted as having no nutritional value or benefit to the animal. Um, but that's not true. They have protein in them. They have fats in them. They have essential nutrients in them. And that if everything is balanced correctly and you have a nice nutrient analysis, then that's what you're looking, that's what you're looking for. Um, byproducts is also a big buzzword that everybody is kind of afraid of. Um, byproducts have a very specific definition. Um, they're mostly going to be organ meats. So they're usually going to be the things that people are, um, that we're not generally going to eat, like liver and lung and kidney. Um, and where otherwise they would be wasted, but now we're using them in pet food. And it's not that they're poor quality foods. They actually can be really highly digestible, have a lot of protein and fat in them, maybe potentially be natural sources for vitamins and minerals. So these are all things that I don't shy away from. Um, um, for a cat, you know, I don't want my cat's primary protein source to be from, from plant. I want their carnivores. I want it to be from, pro from meat protein. Um, the biggest thing on the ingredient label is it's going to be by weight. But you have to remember it's going to account for everything in that, including water. Um, so even if chicken is your first ingredient, if you're weighing whole chicken and then you suck all the water out of it, it's going to weigh something different. So it's really about what the percentage of protein is, so not about the ingredient list. So, so nothing I would be too afraid of. I think another thing we really are in particular would want to know is, while you mentioned in fancy beasts as an example that they do have some high protein, mm -hmm. and a lot of time I sort of shy away from them because they, they could also be too fattening for them, but bottom line, what are, you, in your opinion, some of the things to stay away from? Yeah, so the things to stay away from is a company that doesn't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so the ways that you can figure that out. Um, is some of the things that I look for in terms of quality of a pet food, some of the first indications that you can have is if you can't find that calorie content. So that's a huge red flag to me. Every single company should know the calorie content of their food. If they don't know that, then that's a red flag. I don't even move on. Um, a lot of times you can't necessarily judge the quality of food from the cover of the, the bag itself. So these bags are going to be beautiful. 
Um, uh, you know, they're, they, I mean, marketing is a huge humongous. Um, and that there are a lot of terms on bags that aren't regulated or don't mean anything. So premium, gourmet, holistic, human grade, they don't mean anything. Um, so other things that I'm going to look for um, are who makes the food. So I know that sounds like a simple question, but do they have a third party manufacturer? Are they just formulating the food? and then having somebody else make it. So why do we get these giant pet food recalls? Because all of these foods are being made in one place. So not so sometimes it's better if you own your own processing plant. Then you can be in charge of all of the quality controls that go into that. Um, I think it's important that if there's two ways to ensure a diet is complete and balanced, you can either look at that you can look for the AFCO, um, the AFCO statement of nutritional adequacy. So it's either going to say it went through a feeding trial, which I think is better. So a feeding trial means that they fed it to dogs or cats before it went on the market. Or they just formulated it and then they sold it. So when you see that, the, they just formulated it and now they're selling it, that can mean one of two things. That can mean they, it looked really, really good on paper. They made the diet and they put it on the market. And now who's doing the feed trial? Your animal. Especially if it's a new food. Um, if now the way that if you are going to formulate it and there's no way to know this from the bag the only way to know is by calling the manufacturer is after you made the food did you then go back and test it and make sure that all the nutrients that you said were going to be in it are in it so that's what I'll usually want to know I'll ask them that um, other things is who works for the company so um, who formulated their diet what are their credentials are they a veterinarian or are they a PhD food scientist? One of the things to be really careful of is there's a couple of pet food companies that are by doctor that have, they say that they're doctor, but are they a doctor of veterinary medicine? And sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're not at all. So, go ahead. Do you, what, what do you think of a site like so I'm very wary of Pet Food Advisor because I think the way that they grade food in terms of quality is based on things that probably aren't really about quality. So again, looking at ingredient list, um, and uh, you know, I think some of those websites tend to be really biased against companies and really not trying to judge them independently. Um, so I'm very wary of those. I'm going to tell you guys all a great website I want you all to go to. Um, it's called Wasaba, um, W-S-A, Wasaba, oh, I have it in here, hold on, yeah, yeah, let me go back to the, it's where I got the pictures of the, um, there it is, Wasaba, W-S-A-B-A, um, dot org, or you can just Google it. Um, there are there, and you want to Google Wasaba Nutrition Toolkit, and there are going to be copies of these body condition scoring system on there. There's also going to be two client handouts. Um, so this website is really for vet, it's for veterinarians, basically for resources. But there's two client handouts on there. One is um, surfing the internet for nutritional information. Great advice on there. There's another one about assessing the quality of pet food. Great handouts. Everyone should go. Very, very, very helpful. All right, I'm only going to take like two more questions because it's getting late. And actually, you should all watch Good Morning America tomorrow because good. I'm going to be on it. <laughs> I'm really, really kind of freaked out about it, so I'm actually. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, all right. Well, I'll take these four questions, but they have to be fast. Are we almost done with that? Ready? They canceled. Oh, oh how dare they? That's okay. Why did they do that? Um, oh, because oh, it was a breaking story. Oh, it's a breaking story. Okay. All right, we can take four more questions. All right, you go first. We can call the complaint. Greyhound, the guy in September. He turned four years old this week. So we had a full eight months. Can you buy brand? Tell us what to try. No, it's just very soft food. Still, it, we, we start with honey fluff and cocoa, went to barbie. Then after that we did um, origin. origin, and we think that might have been too rich because it was always really wet shoes. 
um, wellness, which, and now a friend said the uh, natural gallon of venison is free to change. She had a daughter in a greyhound for three years, and the veterinary is free to change. I mean, I've given them sweet potato in between. Yeah. So it's really, really hard for me to know. And the reason why is because usually when I do consults for diarrhea, is it's very, very involved. So I want to know what the diarrhea looks like, how frequently, what's, what, is it, what does it look like. Um, there's a lot of questions I ask. So it's really hard for me to make a diet recommendation without actually looking at your dog first. So I would say probably follow with your veterinarian because there may be more going on here than just the simple food thing. Otherwise, he's not losing weight. Yeah, but it's not always about losing weight. Some dogs that have chronic GI disease, especially large bowel, don't lose weight. So. Well, he's 95 pounds. Mm. He's a big boy. Yeah. All right, who is over here? Go for it. What about giving them human food? Like we keep the chicken, and there was a yep. time we were cooking them broccoli and basically very little real dog food. Yep, so human foods, um, so table foods, human foods, if they should not make up more than 10% of their total calorie intake without them being complete and balanced. So if more than 10% is coming from a homemade diet, then we need to add vitamin and mineral supplementation. And the reason why is because you're going, those diets that we're feeding from the bags and the can, they're complete and balanced. They have all the nutrients in them that they need for their entire life. If only it was so great for us, although I wouldn't want to eat kibble. Um, <laughs> sometimes I think we need to eat kibbles. Um, but, so if they're eating more than 10% of their calories from people food, they need to either have a homemade diet formulated for them and balanced for them, um, or we need to cut back and we need to feed them more because over time that could be an issue nutritionally. Um, all right, next, go for it. I have four cats. Yep. But my cats eat, we're all eating the same, one quarter cup three times a day. Okay. And one of my cats is very thin, one is normal, one of the things that seems muscular and the other one is that you should know back to And he's on all kinds of special food because he's been kind of cold for a Yep. And he really is eating the same as the other cats. And you know, so, I mean, that's good for one, you know, it affects every kind of Yeah. Sometimes that's where, too, you know, they can't all tolerate the same food. And especially with cats, you have to be creative and trying to figure out how how you can feed them separately. It can be well, really challenging. A separate room now yeah. And everything's blocked you up and barricaded in. Um, and I couldn't relax. I just run the food under yep. water. And it oh, is he so. orange? Yeah. Oh, I know him. <laughs> <laughs> he's a social butterfly. Yes. <laughs> and then I sprinkle the relax on it and it sticks and he's got no problem. Good. That's good. Good, good. I think I worked on his case a little bit. Yeah, um, I, I made it that Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Just All right, last one. question on your, um, you say you put all pets that are obese on therapeutic diets. Which ones do you use, like, more payment? I, for cats? I, yeah, well, for cats. So there's two companies that make therapeutic weight loss diets that are the low carbohydrate, that are the therapeutic diets. Um, and the, those two companies are going to be Purina and Science Diet. Um, and so those are usually the ones that I'm going to use. That's Purina DM or MD. Now there's tons of other options available, tons of options. Sometimes those diets don't work for every animal, um, so sometimes I have to switch to another diet. Um, I, I usually say I don't have a favorite weight loss diet because I can make an animal lose weight with any diet, therapeutic diet. So sometimes I will like switch around a little bit. <laughs> Um, just to see what I think about, you know, get an impression of another diet versus another. But um, generally, for the most part, you know, with it's not all about just feeding the food. It's it's really tailoring everything. The food is such a small part of it, um, and making sure you're feeding the right amount. One more question. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> you had some nice things to say about fancy feast. Yeah. Um, do you happen to have any really nice things to say as well about propylene? Oh, I like propylene. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like a lot of foods. I like foods from big companies. I like food from little companies. There are some foods from big companies that I don't like at all. There are some foods from little companies that I don't like at all. So it's not always about the size of the company. It's really about the quality controls and the
people behind it that really go into the quality of the food. So. That's a lot after. Oh, it's so confusing. It's so confusing. Well, I actually have to say that I feel like a lot of relief right now. Because I was like, oh, it's coming. It's going to happen. They called like 20 minutes before we were coming in here. Oh, so, okay, that's better. I feel better. Would you clarify one thing? Sure. When you mentioned that, that website, then you said to Google something, and, you, and I got the assessing quality of pet food. Oh, yeah. The first one was surfing the internet for, for nutritional information. All right. And, and you want to make sure it's the Wasaba Nutrition Toolkit. All right. Yeah. And, and then you go, to, you go to that, and then you go to these other two? Yes. So you're going to, so you can just type in your web browser, Wasaba Nutrition Toolkit. Okay. It'll probably be the first thing that pops up. And then you want to go to, there's probably a section for handouts somewhere on there, or you may already be at that. And there's two handouts. So you're looking for surfing the internet, searching the internet, and then assessing the quality of pet food. And they're going to have a whole bunch of really, really useful nutrition information on there and the websites. So I hope this has been a very helpful talk for you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. No problem. It was such a